Hello to everyone joining us today, no matter where you are, welcome to this very special Alumni Hour event. My name is Ange Lavoie-Pierre, I'm a journalist and presenter at the ABC and I've been hosting this series where we get to have in-depth talks with some of the most extraordinary people to have graduated from the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences at the University of Melbourne. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the Gadigal people, the traditional owners of the land I'm on today, and the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation who are the original owners of the land on which the University of Melbourne is situated. I'd also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the many lands all of us are on. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Today, we are lucky to be talking to scientist and University of Melbourne PhD alum, Associate Professor Misty Jenkins. And we have already had some great, great questions come through in advance for Misty, but if more come to you throughout the session, please feel free to type them into the Q&A and we will try to get through as many as possible at the end. Misty Jenkins leads an immunotherapy lab at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, searching for a cure for brain cancer. She has carved an impressive path to this point. Misty completed her PhD under the guidance of Nobel laureate Professor Peter Doherty and Professor Steve Turner before continuing on to the universities of Cambridge and Oxford. She's a passionate advocate for brain cancer patients, but also for the next generation of researchers. Welcome Misty and thank you for making the time to join us. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I appreciate that this a uh, simple question has a slightly complicated answer, but for the uninitiated, we're going to start with the question, what is immunotherapy? Oh, look, well, it's a great question. I mean, um, <laughs> you know, immunotherapy is essentially using your own immune system to fight your own cancer. So it can take several forms, either by using drugs like antibodies, which can help boost the immune system that you already have. Um, or actually we can use, and that's for tumours that are invisible to the immune system, we can also engineer immune cells to recognise a tumour. You see, cancer is a pretty tricky disease and just a few genetic changes can make the difference between a healthy cell and a diseased cell. Um, and so treatments like surgery and radiation and chemotherapy, which have been around for a long time, um, are non-specific and also kill healthy cells, which is why you get sick and lose your hair. But our immune system has evolved to tell the difference between infected and healthy. And so uh, immunotherapy takes advantage of this specificity and utilises it. Um, you know, we can utilise this for personalised medicine for cancer patients. Right. So it sounds like it's a bit of an umbrella term for a few different kinds of practices uh, and different, almost different kinds of science in some ways. Uh, is that unusual to have all these disparate things grouped together like that? Yeah, no, not at all. And I mean, I think when we think about cancer as well, cancer is not just one disease. Cancer is thousands of different diseases. And so I think, you know, we've, we've, we're already treating different cancers in different ways. I mean, even, you know, breast cancer, there's so many different treatments depending on the kind you have and, and brain cancer is the same as well. So um, this is just really taking personalised medicine and, and ramping up another notch and really be, being able to personally tailor therapies to the individual for the kind of cancer that they have. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's extremely cool. Uh, how new is this area of medicine? Yeah, well, when you think about the fact that, you know, we only had um, surgery available for centuries, in fact, dating back to the ancient Egyptians. And then in around 1900, um, Pierre and Marie Curie discovered that radium could kill diseased cells and radiation was born. And then it was around the Second World War, we, had, we got chemotherapy and we, it really hasn't been a lot since. So in the whole scheme of things, it's actually relatively new. Um, really, it's, been, it's, it's exploded um, really over the last um, decade, probably 20 years ago, you know, there's some really seminal findings um, published and really over the last sort of even five years, it's just really um, taken the world by storm as a fourth pillar for cancer therapy. It feels like it hasn't quite seeped into the public consciousness yet. I, when people imagine treatments for chemo, rather treatments for cancer, what they imagine is chemo and radiation. That's kind of where it stops. Do you think people are starting to understand that this is another pillar, as you say? Yeah, I think so. And we've seen, you know, we've seen, yeah, we've seen a bit of a shifting of the dial, and there's really breakthrough therapies, um, you know, start to hit hit the news um, this year. And I think, you know, when you think about it in terms of even um, you know, COVID and with what we've been through with this pandemic last year and, and ongoing, you know, the world has, I think, a heightened awareness, appreciation and understanding for medical research and science and, you know, and boosting our immune system or creating, you know, creating or engineering a new ones 
what do arm it against either a virus you know or a cancer cell and our our immune cells have you know have evolved very specialized mechanisms to do this and so we're just taking advantage of that so i think um yes i think it, i started seeing you know hearing about it more at uh, mainstream dinner parties and things this is on on people's agenda that is i think with the, with the internet as well i mean you know cancer patients are probably more informed now than they ever have been before you know and um, you know, there's, there's a lot of information now online that people can wade through and take to their oncologist and take to their doctors and say, you know, what's it, what's all this about? Is this something that, that could apply to me? Yeah, and, and as you say, I think, you know, that's that's so astute. I think the world has had something of a crash course in yeah. medical literacy over the course of the yeah. pandemic, although I suspect that stops short of understanding specifically lymphocytes, uh, which is where your work focuses on. Um, can you talk us through what are lymphocytes and how they work? Again, another tricky question. <laughs> yeah, sure. So I work on T lymphocytes um, and they're called actually T lymphocytes because they actually go to go to school in, in an organ called the thymus. Um, and this is where they learn to distinguish how to recognize self so they don't attack our own body. And sometimes, of course, that does go wrong and results in autoimmunity um, and non-self, which is, of course, you know, virus transformed or malignant or cancer cells. And so it's that discovery um, that won Peter Doherty and Rolf Sink and Agel the Nobel Prize. And the job of these T cells is to recognize cancerous um, or infected infectious cells um, and to work with other cells in the immune system to destroy them. And so um, my work over many years has been focused on a specialised subgroup of T cells uh, called the cytotoxic T cells. This is the killer. So this recognises a target, it latches on um, and releases specialised weapons in the form of toxic proteins and enzymes to kill the target cell. And they're also serial killers. So they can deliver their kiss of death and then they can detach and go on and kill another one and kill another one, sequentially taking out the diseased cells around them. And so it's this phenomenon that we really want to harness when we're designing immunotherapies that use these little T cell soldiers as, as a living therapy. So we wanna make sure that they can kill their cancer specifically, but also not get overactivated, that they cause damaging inflammation or become completely exhausted um, and, and die. So it's their capacity you know, to self-renew as well. That's really the power of this type of immunotherapy. And so is that limit that you just described uh, so that the T cells don't become exhausted or overactive, is that kind of the limit, the sort of natural ceiling at the moment on, on what they can achieve in the field of immunotherapy? Yeah, that's a great question. It's, it's what, that's one of them. The other, the other big one is that we just don't have enough targets we don't have enough tools in the toolkit so we we can make these therapies we can unleash them on the cancer we do we're all you know the world now is doing that very well and very efficiently the big stop gap is um is finding um targets on the cancer cell so what is it about that cancer cell that makes it different to a healthy cell that we can target the immune system to knowing what those specific cancer specific proteins are or proteins and targets um, is really key. And so I, in my opinion, there has to be a lot more, more work done over the coming years to, to essentially, you know, identify more and then we can start, you know, attacking them from a multi-pronged approach. And you are putting your uh, effort at the moment into a, a very particular and uh, I guess devastatingly difficult um, form of cancer, brain cancer in particular, um, and I've read, please feel free to correct me, maybe the survival rates aren't, quite, I haven't got this quite right, but I've read that the survival rate for brain cancer is uh, 20% or, you know, one in five. Mm. Do those statistics have a daunting effect on you or do you find that the magnitude of the challenge just gives you more energy? Yeah, no, you're right. It's, it's, it's truly awful disease. And what's worse about it is that the dial hasn't shifted in decades. I mean, and some brain tumours are actually worse than others. Um, and brain cancer is also a different disease in adults and children. So um, my lab focuses on our energy on the worst ones. So the tumours with the poorest prognosis, and this sees five year survival rates for adult glioblastoma at about one in 20, not one in five. Mm. And actually, um, and even worse um, for kids, you know, little children with a diffuse midline glioma, which is almost universally fatal within a year of diagnosis. So, um, you know, meeting families who have lost their loved ones um, is absolutely core at our motivation for us. It's what gets us out of bed in the morning. It's what keeps us staying in the lab at night um, because those statistics are fairly depressing and need to change. Um, what kind of future do you see for the type of intervention that you're researching 
now? I mean, obviously it's, it's very exciting. And um, as you say, it's starting to be kind of talked at around dinner tables and, and that's a sign that you're starting to make some real progress, but where might we see it being used in 10 or even 20 years from now? Yeah, it's a, a great question. I think in the future, I mean, as I said, it's a personalized medicine. So I definitely predict a very tailored personalized response that will be treating cancer at an individual level. We'll be molecularly typing them, um, looking at exactly what the genetic makeup and the protein makeup is of that, of that specific tumor that you have that's specific to your genetics um, and, and be treating them specifically. But I think even beyond that, if you were to look, you know, really think really futuristic and big picture about this, um, just as you can have a cell therapy with a power to self-renew, um, just like a vaccine, I could envisage that in the future, you know, this approach of personalized medicine, not just treating cancer at an individual level from diagnosis to personal treatment, but we could potentially even use this sort of approach to essentially vaccinate against cancer in the first place. Um, I think, you know, we obviously need to do much more. Um, and again, coming back to the kinds of targets that we'd need to identify in the first place, we need to learn more about um, what the cancer cells need to survive and to become immortal. But I think in the very distant future, it's not inconceivable that we might visit our doctor for our COVID shot in one arm and our, you know, anti breast cancer or anti-brain cancer injection in another, in another arm. Um, and I certainly think that um, that's very future looking. I think at the moment, we just, we literally haven't shifted the dial in decades. Um, still a lot of work to do before, <laughs> before you think about that stage. Uh, but hopefully one day we'll, you know, be able to offer patients and families some hope for the future where there's really currently very little. I, I didn't expect to hear this kind of optimism from someone working particularly in uh, trying to cure brain cancer, uh, it's fantastic that you have, in contrast, I think, speaking to other researchers, I've heard the opposite. I've heard, well, look, we're kind of not, we don't really talk anymore about curing cancer. We talk about uh, making people's lives livable and managing their cancer because cancer is becoming more common. Obviously, as you've noted, it's an incredibly broad field that we're talking about when we say cancer. But um, how do you account for that r huge disparity in uh, and? In, in how you see the future of cancer treatment and how some of your colleagues do. Yeah, in, in terms of it be, you know, being having a sort of pessimistic approach. And yeah. I, look, some, some people talk about not being it not being possible to cure, and you talk about a vaccine. I mean, it's 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 it, you know such refreshing optimism. Look, yeah, it is it is optimistic because it is pretty grim at the moment. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, but as I said, cancer is not one disease. There are some there are some cancers like leukemia in kids where, you know, 30 years ago, 90% of the kids didn't survive and now 90% do survive. And that's been due to advances in chemotherapy. So there have been some cancers that have absolutely gone leaps and bounds ahead and that now aren't the death sentence that, that they used to be. There are others, um, rare and, and high mortality cancers that are just, you know, that are just tr still truly awful, you know. And I think we need to be, you know, we need to be aware of that just because something is a little bit rarer in our population, it doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't need that investment. Um, look, I'm a realist. I sit somewhere in the middle, Ange, um, between, you know, knowing what's feasible and real, um, but with a healthy dose of optimism, um, but also knowing that, you know, in order to, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of work to do. And so in order to do that, it does require investment. You know, we need capacity, we need scientists and needs funding, uh, unfortunately, and the pot's only so big. And so I think, you know, being realistic about it, it's going to take a very large investment to really see, see the dial shift in a, in a major way, you know, in the next 10, 20 years. As we've been talking about, you're working in an area that is uh, new-ish on the scale of cancer treatments. Uh, a lot is still unknown and often in unknown territory in science, there's often trial and error and that's a big feature of, of that. Has that been your experience? Yeah, look, there is, isn't there? And I think, um, you know, being, being brave isn't necessarily my strong suit, but I, I did see an area you know, that had had very little research done over many years. And so when I did start my own lab, I wanted to work in a collaborative space where I could do something new and bring bring my immunology expertise to, to the brain cancer um, and, you know, make, it, make an impact there. So certainly being a scientist makes you very resilient. I'm used to hearing the word no, and I'm used to being told that my grant won't be funded or my paper won't be published and the experiments fallen on the floor or the cells have died in a dish for no apparent reason. And these are all things that we learn to take in our stride. So I guess 
you get more comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, I know that to succeed in this area, I need to keep learning new things. I need to increase my knowledge of neuroanatomy and physiology. I need to work across disciplines um, with computational scientists and, and clinicians. So I think the sort of the key message here um, about trial and error and sort of taking ourselves out of our comfort zone is that um, when I'm uncomfortable or don't know the answer or something's outside my area of expertise, I ask for help. I think the key message here is that science is most definitely a team sport. I don't think anyone does anything in total isolation. And we're working on approaches that have um, the foundations of knowledge that are underpinned by our predecessors. You know, we all stand on the shoulders of giants and we make our own contributions because others have started to pave the way. So it means that we can um, um, trial and error in that sense. But, you know, we get comfortable um, um, you know, working with people with complementary expertise, you know, to solve complex problems like brain cancer, it needs a complex solution and needs people approaching those questions from all different angles. So I think, you know, and how do you deal with the trial and error? Well, as they say, when you get locked down, when you get knocked down, we pick ourselves up again. Yeah, interesting to hear you talk about uh, coping with, you know, error or failure as a, as a skill that builds over time as well. I think I would have definitely done, done well to hear that when I was when I was younger. Wouldn't we all? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about how it is that you got to this point in your career. Um, starting with, I suppose, what drew you to this area of science in the first place? Yeah, I was a, I was a pretty nerdy and curious kid, Ange, who who gave up weekend sport in favour of joining St John Ambulance to learn about the body and compete in first aid competitions across the state. <laughs> and so <laughs> learning about biology and anatomy from a young age actually ignited a curiosity in me for learning about germs and bugs um, and then from there the immune system. So as I grew, I shifted from, um, you know, fishing with my dad and looking through binoculars at the birds to down microscopes at cells. And I thought that observing their behaviour was just so cool. And I just wanted to learn more. Well, yeah, natural curiosity is, is I guess, kind of a predisposition for, uh, for being a, a researcher. Um, has your motivation I guess from that base natural curiosity that you're describing that that you you know it was present as a child has that evolved over time as you've got deeper and deeper into uh, your chosen field yeah I think it definitely has evolved it hasn't changed I think it's just become more refined I think you know as you follow your passions and then you know you go to university and you select your subjects that align with your interests and then I became more resolute in studying immunology I realized that was what I wanted to do um, which culminated in a PhD looking at how T cells respond to influenza. Um, and now, thankfully, the whole world has taken an interest in immunology, whether they like it or not. Um, but thankfully, I think, you know, everyone's become a little bit more literate in understanding how important it is to have a healthy immune response. Um, and also now the power of being able to manipulate that either with vaccines or therapies. It strikes me that you've kind of chosen these uh, really disparate fields like Im immunology on the one hand which is such a hopeful uh, area to and a hopeful path to walk down and then you went oh and just to kind of out balance it out I'll go for brain cancer as well which is you know in your own words the, the dial hasn't moved there in quite some time um, and that's and that's why because you know because we've you know we've um, we haven't had any new treatments for brain cancer in decades um, since radiation was combined with um, temozolomide chemotherapy and there's been literally nothing since and nothing's worked and the other the other sort of funny well the other thing about the brain as opposed, opposed to cancer and other areas of your body is that it's in your brain there's a blood brain barrier and a lot of drugs don't get across there actually so you know whereas t cells in the immune system does you know there is an immune system in the brain and so it seems like a, a perfect delivery system so I, you know so why not bring a bit of that immunology hope into an area where it you know, clearly needs some. Mm. Um, as far as the outside eye I can see, you have had uh, what could best be described as a meteoric career thus far. <laughs> you've started at Ballarat, which we haven't uh, talked too much about, but uh, you've gone end up in Melbourne. Uh, then you're doing a PhD supervised by a Nobel laureate, um, going on to attend fellowships 
at Cambridge and Oxford because one clearly wasn't enough. Uh, and now the whole got- Harry Potter experience. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. Uh, and and to top it all off, you've now got your own lab at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. Um, I wanted to ask if meteoric feels like the right word to you. No, I could, you could I physically recoil hearing that. No, <laughs> not at all. No, I had look, I had no idea where my journey was going to lead me. As you said, I'm from Ballarat and um, my it was fairly sheltered really in terms of certainly in terms of my exposure to academia and um you know and I just had a really supportive family and great teachers and I realized you know that anything worth doing isn't easy um, and I think if you ask any academic on the planet they'll tell you the tough road it is to be a scientist the rejection which I've mentioned already the long hours the late nights the inequality of a system that judges you on your last five years and only in recent years, you know, has recognised career break for things like parental leave, for example. But mm-hmm. I think, you know, so it's, it's a tough gig sometimes, but I think at the core of a scientific career is a deep passion and curiosity. Um, I've worked across eight labs and in every place I've been in Australia and the UK that you mentioned, um, all the people that I've worked with from the professors to the students have all shared an insatiable spark for just wanting to understand how things work. You, you mentioned there... Uh some of the limitations within um, medical research uh, and and how people see you and judge you throughout your career. I guess I wanted to know if there were any contrasts that you observed between that world in the UK and and that world here in Australia. In short, no. Um, I, look, I think I think that these barriers are are everywhere. So a lot of the countries have more and less issues than we do here. UK and Australia, in my in my experience, was fairly similar. Mm-hmm. Um, look, we've come a long way in gender equity um, over the last ten, you know, twenty and ten years, and even even five years, I would say actually, um, whereby you know, with the introduction of the Athena Swan Charter. Uh, mandating that organisations must be addressing their gender inequity and inclusion, um, you know, implementing policies around this, and and to some extent some cultural change. So we have we have come a long way, um, but we still we still have a way to go to, to truly achieve um, you know gender neutral and, and and inclusive workplaces. And and look, and medical re- science and medical research is is not immune to this as are you know just like any other professional um, workplace. Misty, so far we've been talking about your research career predominantly, but I wanted to ask you about some of the work that you do outside the lab, uh, particularly when it comes to educational opportunities for Indigenous Australians and for women in research, something we were touching on just there. Uh, Maybe you could tell us about some of those projects. Yeah, look, this is something I'm really passionate about, primarily because I've seen inequality firsthand, both in the educational space with far fewer Indigenous kids attending or finishing um, high school or going to university um, through to the massive inequities we see across the research and healthcare sector for Aboriginal people. Um, Aboriginal people are routinely left off uh, medical clinical trials, routinely left off transplant waiting lists in numbers that just don't stack up and can't be explained by anything other than racism. So it's something that I feel very passionate about and some of the solutions um, are to have more Indigenous people in positions where that won't happen, to be the doctors and the nurses and the educators. Um, and, and, and on the gender side, having more women in STEM, particularly in leadership positions, responsible for setting culture and the structures and the policies to drive inclusion, because I believe this is how we be innovative. You know, we've got to keep um, standing up for those in the row behind us. I think when you're sitting in the front row, you get the best view and opportunities. Um, and then there are others that have far more barriers to success and additional roadblocks that that most don't even consider. So for me, it's important to have a public discourse about this. Um, I believe it's the only way that will achieve true equity and inclusion. Um, And equity and inclusion is important to me really for two main reasons. One, because it's the right thing to do ethically, Um, but also that really that I believe that a bright and innovative future for Australia does lie within a community of diverse individuals that work cross-culturally, intergenerationally, bridging socioeconomic divides. You know, the best way to advance our society, and, you know, we touched on kind of solving complex problems like brain cancer, is to have diverse teams, interdisciplinary teams, and coming at complex problems from different angles. I mean, just in my job, um, you know, I have to work with a range of different expertise and backgrounds, and 
you know, without that sort of diversity of lens, um, you know, we I think we well, there's a lot of literature around this actually that you know that that people are less innovative, you know, and then you know that results in less drugs and treatments to take through to the clinic. So all kinds of um, all kinds of science are needed. Yeah, and uh, you've kind of taken it well beyond the public discourse in terms of your efforts in this area. Um, I understand you you have made multiple visits out to remote communities yourself. Um, tell us about what you. What, what you do out there and what you're trying to, yeah, what it is you're trying to achieve with those visits? Yeah, so some of those visits you're referring to are um, uh, associated with my role with the National Centre for Indigenous Genomics, of which I was a, um, a member for a few years and, and, and chair um, a couple of years ago. And that's a la very large collection of Indigenous blood samples that are um, housed at the ANU in Canberra. They were collected back in the 60s and 70s and 80s um, and are now sitting in liquid nitrogen. And so, you know, this was a part of a consultation to go back out to these communities and say, did you know your blood's sitting in Canberra, <laughs> yours and your ancestors? And, and, and how should we talk to you about this? And what do you want to do about it? You know, and, um, and everything, you know, was on the table, you know, to repatriate it and come and bury it back out on the country um, or, or to be in, or to, or to actually say, actually, no, I'd like to do something useful with it. And, and so, you know, have, having those conversations about what does that mean to do something useful with it? Um, you know, when you go to the doctor, when you go to the GP and get a blood test, any sort of clinical genetics test, your genome is compared to a white, essentially a white European genome. And so what that has meant, and there are lots of case studies of this now, is that Indigenous people have been really left behind um, the potential benefits that clinical genetics and medicine science can bring um, to those communities, just be purely because for being undiagnosed or not having, you know, mutations that are, you know, or mutations have been discovered that that weren't, weren't necessarily picked up um, from the reference the reference genome. So, I think there's a, it's a huge exploding area and one that's layered with um, issues around, you know, indigenous sovereignty and and you know, data ownership and benefit sharing and collaboration and engagement. So. Um, yeah, it's just it's a space that um, it's a space that Indigenous people need to be at the forefront of, you know, owning owning their own data. Yeah, I want to spend a little bit longer on this because it's something that blew me away when I found it out uh, that and, and that is that the um, the DNA of Aboriginal people in Australia is one of the few groups in the world that's kind of missing in terms of our collective knowledge of mapping DNA. Is that is that um, about your understanding and, and how are the efforts going to kind of close that uh, gap, so to speak, in knowledge? Yeah, so, so I mean, even that's sort of such a colonial, you know, to sort of map, map the genome. And, and I think that's what, you know, back in the 1990s, there was a, there, that was the Human Genome Variation Project, which Indigenous, you know, which was dubbed the Vampire Project, and you know, scientists came out and went out to communities and said, "But we want to take your blood. We need to map the genome." And 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 community groups were like, "What? <laughs> um, no, we, we're not interested. We don't want to be a part of that." And so, you know, generally, and so it's more complicated than that. And 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 I think you know, we could, gosh, we could talk for you could have hours of programs around you know what that means for companies like Twenty Three and Me and Ancestry.com that have very small numbers you know I think they have about three now individuals um, indigenous individuals in their database and so that therefore now they can they will tell their client base what percentage Aboriginal you are which is incredibly complicated um, you know um, ethically and, and culturally uh, for people to to understand and to process so yeah, there's a there's a whole there's a whole other episode in there, Ange. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I'm I'm quite fascinated by that area. Um, but I think I think it is wonderful nuance that you've brought to light that um, you know so much of what is missing there is consent as well. Yeah, look, so exactly, and that's it. So from my perspective, I just want um, average, you know, different mobs, Aboriginal communities to own their own data, um, to to be you know truly and deeply informed and consented. Um, to participate in any of these processes. Um, and, you know, we've had, you know, um, a bit, you know, there's lots of wonderful things that DNA has been used for in Indigenous communities, such as, for example, the repatriation of stolen uh, remains, ancestors' remains, which um, litter the, the museums around the globe and particularly in Europe. Um, and as slowly, you know, there's been a big movement over the last few years to repatriate um, a lot of these remains and to provenance them. And so, you know, DNA has been quite useful for that. Mm. Um, 
there are a lot of young graduates who'll be watching this today. What advice would you give them as they begin uh, a career in health science, potentially in research, particularly at a, at a moment, uh, you know, such an incredible juncture as the one that we currently find ourselves at? <laughs> yeah, definitely. So uh, look, so much, so much advice. Mm. Um, you know, work hard uh, to stay curious and be creative. As I said, I think I think people think about science scientists as um, old and dusty and boring, and mostly men in a white coat, usually wearing spectacles. Um, and it's actually quite a creative job. You've got to think outside the box and approach problems from different angles. So, um, to you know, to keep that creative spark, um, to find your passion um, and to nurture your passion, whatever it is. Um, I'm a big believer in creating your own opportunities. People say opportunities pass you by. I, I don't subscribe to that at all. I think you have to go out and look for them and create them. Um, surround yourself with exceptional mentors. I've been really grateful um, to those who have trained me and taught me. People like Peter and Steve and Gillian and Joe and uh, Fiona and Mick and Alex and Marcia and Phil as a whole, you know, you all know who you are, but um, I've been fortunate to work with some exceptional scientists and some wonderful human beings. Uh, which really shapes shapes you, I think. So surround yourself with great people, and also that um you know science science is all about making observations and interpretations. It's about testing a theory or a hypothesis, designing a well controlled experiment to obtain a clear outcome. So it's not magic; it's systematic. So you know, and to embrace the scientific method, to be rigorous, have attention to detail, plan well, plan your experiments well, plan your career path well. I used to have a five-year goal, now I have a 10 or 15-year goal, but to, to break down tasks into small achievable ones. Um, and as I said before, but mostly to be resilient, to learn how to pick yourself up pretty quickly, I think after each inevitable setback, um, and to be brave and bold. Um, if you see something isn't right, to advocate for change. The system has come a long way, as I said before, in the last decade, um, but I still think we have quite a way to go to achieve equity. So I think that's going definitely going to take still a few brave souls to keep um, pushing that agenda. Um, but lastly, um, I think to have fun, science is fun and making discoveries that might end up in the clinic one day to help people is fun and it's a privilege. Um, so enjoy the ride. Um, and if you do get a platform one day, don't forget to stand up for those in the back row. Mm. That is such a long list of advice. I Sorry, yeah. it, but it's been incredible I, advice. I can go on. <laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> No, actually, I was hoping you'd go into a little bit more detail because I think um, make your making your own opportunities is such wonderful advice. Uh, but and I think you know that can be so personality based, having the kind of innate sense of how to to go about doing that. Um, I was hoping you could maybe give us uh, maybe some some specific anecdotes about times where you've done that. And I know you're, I'm, I'm getting a sense that you're a slightly modest person, but maybe you'll have to overcome that um, to answer this question. Um, so what I'm referring to there when I'm talking about creating your own opportunities is that sometimes, and we, I, talked, I touched on this before about making yourself uncomfortable, um, taking yourself out of your comfort zone sometimes and doing something that is a bit brave and a bit bold and maybe contacting that person that you're absolutely petrified of, um, but that they're going to, because you think they're too senior, they're not going to have time for you. They're going to slam a door in your face, but you'll find that, um, and I've certainly found over my career that, you know, amazing, incredible, you know, very senior people um, are also just humans at the end of the day and part of a family and have friends and loved ones. And so, you know, and, and are also really supportive of keen, you know, hardworking, diligent and interested students. And so, you know, if you do sort of go knocking on someone's door, you'll find that, you know, that they will make time for you. And, you know, can I buy you a cup of coffee? Have we got 20 minutes? Um, and so I think, you know, sort of to, so to start that, um, creating those opportunities and, and getting to sort of, um, to meet the, the people that you need to meet to get the advice that you need to get to, you know, to make more informed decisions about your pathway, whatever, whatever it is. Mm. Mm. Um, and you were also talking about a need for boldness uh, and innovativeness in people as they kind of move through their careers and that that's something that yeah. will really help them along their way. Yeah. Um, how can students do that? How can they be encouraged to do that? And is it becoming more difficult, do you think? Yeah, that's such a great question. I think there's really, 
I think there's probably three things in this. So um, I have a 10 year old daughter and sometimes, you know, if she comes out of school just learning how to learn, I'll be happy. So I think we need to encourage our students to be curious, to ask questions. The world is a beautiful and complicated place. Um, and, and yes, we have to be bold and, and to be innovative. Um, but what that means is that we need to, I don't think it's necessarily harder than it was a generation ago, but we now have, um, we have access to information on a whole different scale than we had certainly when I went through school. You know, we can make more informed decisions than ever before, but we need to teach our students and we need to learn how to distinguish a reputable source of information from quackery. Um, and we've seen a lot of that in 2020 in the, in the COVID world, haven't we? So that's, what's, that's one. I think the second thing is that you need to give yourself and we need to give our students a chance, a license to fail, to breed that resilience. Otherwise, they'll lack motivation to be bold and try new things if they're just worried about failure all the time. So I think without the fear of needing to have a competitive edge to win where everyone gets a prize or every kid gets a ribbon, I don't, don't subscribe to those views. I think being innovative sometimes means swimming against the current and not complying with the norm. And sometimes there are structural and cultural reasons in our society and in our workplaces that make this even harder. So to overcome that, we actually need to be brave and we need to fail. And I think the third point is um, that, um, that there are just natural roadblocks as well. So, you know, our national funding system isn't exactly designed to fund high risk, high reward, crazy ideas. You know, you have to have a track record. You have to be established in this area. And so that sometimes means that new and bold concepts are not funded and so therefore not feasible. Um, so this is why, you know, as researchers, you know, we rely so much on philanthropy to fill that hole. Um, before we can go to, you know, to, to the, the federal government, for example, um, and ask to fund our research. So, you know, so I would encourage all students and young researchers to keep striving to innovate and be brave and keep talking about their big ideas because with some systems change, we could actually start the innovation, change to change the innovation landscape, I think, in this country. Um, failure and the ability to cope with it seems to have kind of emerged as a real theme of our conversation today. Uh, and, and you've mentioned a couple of times the enormity of what's available to us on the internet and the effect that that yeah. has. I just remember as a young person, because um, the internet was kind of coming of age around the same time that I was, uh, and, and feeling uh, as if the world was too, uh, was so big and, and that every idea, that good idea that could be had had already been thought of by someone else. Um, is that part of uh part of the challenge do you think as well with kind of get, you know encouraging people young people new people in the field and students very young students to um, be brave enough to to push forward oh 100 i think that's a great way to think about it Ange. Uh, you know because yes you know the, the never before has you know there's more advanced technology in my iphone than there is in a nuclear reactor i mean i i never take that for granted that i have wikipedia in my pocket or you know, I don't have to line up at the school library to access the Encyclopedia Britannica CD-ROM. Um, you know, it's extraordinary. The difficulty that we all face, and particularly our kids and students, is that is that how to distinguish, you know, what is a reputable source of information. Um, you know, you just open a Google browser and type in cancer cure, you know, and you will find a plethora of just absolute rubbish and snake oil salesmen. So, you know, we, we really need to teach our students, you know, to, to distinguish a reputable source um, from, from, a, from a quack. Um, and um, yeah, and, and, then, and then to be able to have the confidence and the bravery and to be bold to, to, to innovate. Because I think once you start digging down into the weeds a little bit, a lot of, you'll realise a lot of it, what you're reading online is actually just a lot of rubbish. <laughs> yeah, and so if you go you know go to those original sources have a real look at what's out there and, and there's there's still plenty to do trust me yes yeah and and you would know there's I a think. lot of work to be done there's a lot of you know we have a lot of things that we need um therapies technologies um you know i mean just even you know, climate change i mean you know this country needs to go through a whole revolution there with technology changes so there's just so many avenues, I think, for um, for you know new graduates and students now and areas to um, to get involved in. It's it's kind of exciting. Speaking of work still to be done, uh, I wanted to ask what your plans are next. What what you kind of um, see as as your future, Missy? For me, well, um, I think, gosh, 
I think first and foremost, I think this pandemic is a world changing event, isn't it? I think most people living through this have not lived through this before. And my hope for society is that it creates an opportunity to strengthen um, you know, society's awareness and understandings of the, of the importance of medical research. So I definitely would like to play a role in that. But for me in the short term, um, I hope to make an impact in applying immunotherapies to treat brain cancer. And we're already actively um, planning the next stage for a clinical trial um, for adult glioblastoma. So that's really exciting. I also hope to train, you know, continue to train the next generation of diverse scientists and hopefully more indigenous scientists, um, you know, which will need to contribute to the many complex health issues that we're all facing. Um, and I also hope to have the opportunity to progress my leadership roles and continue, you know, to contribute to the strategic health and medical research agenda at the state and the national level. Um, you mentioned that there's a five, a 10 and a 15 year plan. I don't know anyone else with a 15 year plan. Can I ask what's in it? Well, you know, when you sort of, you know, when you, when, when you think about um, the team that I'm building and, and this great pipeline we've created and this whole new research program, I would hope that, you know, in 15 years I've trained you know, so many, the next generation and, you know, built so much capacity in that program and that team that they won't need me looking at every experiment anymore and that I could, you know, progress into more of a leadership position, you know, at, a, at an institute or at a, or at a state level. So, um, yeah, I definitely have aspirations for leadership, um, which is, you know, um, you know, it's just another thing that keeps colour and movement in my day. It, it is famously hard to attract uh, government funding for research, as you've mentioned, and there's a direct relationship uh, between how common a cancer is, how expensive it is to cure the distance yet to go, um, and how easy it is to attract funding. When you've got something on your hands like brain cancer, which, uh, you know, you've got some in those areas I've just mentioned, you've got the cards stacked against you. How do you make the case to, to government to say, um, we, we are deserving of this funding when they've got all these other hands out for, for more common and, and perhaps uh, more common cancers where the finish line is just that much closer? Yeah, it's a, look, it's a great and a, and a really sensitive question, isn't it? You know, the, the inequity of cancer research funding and organizations do a, a pretty good job of, of keeping it equitable but of course you have a lot of um uh, you know rightly so amazing foundations that that have you know disease specific focus you know a, a focus on a particular cancer and what that's meant is that more common cancers um tend to have more research dollars put to uh, raised and and therefore and when we know and this is a fact I mean, a, you know we know that when we invest in medical research it does result in good clinical health outcomes. So, you know, patient survival increases, you know, um, prognosis get better, your five-year survival rates improve, um, you know, particularly, I mean, we're, and we've seen that, you know, we've seen the dial shift over the last 30 years for breast cancer, um, whereby, you know, your five-year survival 30 years ago was 50% and now it's 75%. And that's, that is due directly to a huge increase in um, research. And development and also early awareness and detection as well of course uh, for breast cancer but for other rarer cancers that hasn't been the case and so um and i you know and i think that there's a really strong case to make here and and in fact you know patients um family groups and advocates did make this case um, a couple of years ago to the federal government and were successful in um in the establishment uh, of a program a funding program around brain cancer for this reason, because the dial hasn't shifted in such a long time. Um, but there are a lot of cancers that still need the spotlight on them. And, and that and I think therefore that's where, you know, awareness, communication and advocacy can play such a huge role, you know, to really influence um, our, our state and federal governments to, to really shine a spotlight on some of these really poor prognosis cancers. Mm. Uh, Misty, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure and I've learned so much speaking to you. Oh, pleasure's all mine. Thanks, Ange.
Um, so we do have uh, some questions from uh, the audience watching today. Um, we've also uh, we've also managed. Well, I've we've had some sent in ahead of time as well. Um, I'll start here. Uh, I, I well, actually, this is something that I noticed as well is that you you, you use a lot of um, imagery and metaphor in the way that you explain um, a lot of the very complicated concepts that that you need to communicate whether that's lymphocytes or immunotherapy really complicated stuff uh was that something that you had to really work to get good at and how important is that do you think in solving the challenges of immunotherapy and in your area of research in particular i guess i'm thinking in particular here of attracting funding as well yeah yeah thanks for the question i think i come from a long line of storytellers mm. and so you know i think you know breaking these really complex subjects down into into stories and you know into basic language that everyone can understand science isn't that complicated everyone does have the capacity to understand these these concepts and so you know as, as scientists we we do try hard to to talk about our science to the public in a lay way and make it easy for everyone to understand because we want everyone to be involved we, you know we want we want the world you know we we love talking about our research i uh, love nothing more than talking about my research and i love um talking to everyone about it and having you know open days and bringing the public into my lab and demystifying the whole experience really um, and i do think it's important um, a, we, as we saw in the interview, we talked a little bit about the scientific literacy of the public. It's, you know, it's really important that, that the wider public does understand the basics of science and health and medical research and how it works, um, how experiments are done, but also how the funding structures are, because, you know, it's with awareness and, you know, information uh, that, we, that we can promote and advocate for change in policies and funding structures. So that's, that's really important. And we know that every dollar we spend in, you know, in health and medical research uh, we receive at least a three dollar um, you know outcome in our healthcare sector. So you know investing in research actually helps us all. And so the more that we're all aware of it and talking about it and understanding it, the better for everyone. And I think you know never has it been more important for to to build trust with the general public as well between the medical community um, and you know just because of what we're needing to achieve now in terms of. Um, convincing people that that vaccines, in particular COVID nineteen vaccines, are safe. Absolutely correct, and we've seen some of this rhetoric play out. Um, you know, last year and the previous years under the Trump administration, um, and now with sort of the anti vax and, and sort of co and the, the the fear, you know, the fear of these new vaccines and people not really understanding the you know really appreciating how extraordinary this moment is, and particularly yesterday, as we saw the first vaccinations across Australia, what, what an extraordinary moment in history that really was for us all um, scientifically and at this, pinnacle, at this point in history. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, and, how, and how it's not, they haven't been rushed, you know, it's been years, it's been actually decades of research in the making to get us to this point where, you know, where they can be generated, you know, um, quite quickly and also have robust our Australian, um, you know, regulatory processes are to have them approved. So it's it's really something to be quite proud of, um, and to, and and yeah, that's great to see the public take such an interest in it. Um, I've got a question here from today's live audience. How okay. important uh, was it for you uh, and your career to spend time overseas? Yeah, that's a good question because it's something that we as scientists think about quite a lot, you know, the importance of overseas um, experience and exposure. Certainly for me, it really allowed me to meet people and from disciplines and countries that I never would have had the opportunity to meet. I mean, it really does, particularly going to a place like Oxford and Cambridge, it does have that that college that college. You know, the Harry, and I alluded to the Harry Potter experience, where you really are in your college wearing your black gowns and you have different academics come for dinner every night. So, the exposure that you know a girl from Ballarat got in that experience <laughs> was extraordinary. You know, and it was it was quite eye opening, and the networks and the connections I made there. Um, but look, really, is it is it absolutely necessary? Then of course it's not. You know, we have a we have incredible. Um, universities and, and workplaces and medical research institutes here in Australia. So it's not a, it's not a necessary for your career, but it's a really great personal experience to have. 
do you think that's something that that's a dynamic that'll change a little bit now that we've all moved our lives online a little bit and there is kind of uh it, it's almost like it's supercharged global the globalization effect and and now we are all more visible to people overseas because we're all just so much more literate and fluent in this kind of technology we're using right now Absolutely. And isn't that wonderful that the fact that I, I don't have to wait a year to go and, and see an international speaker talk about their science and hear their results. I can just invite them into our Zoom box and, and to join us at a lab meeting in Melbourne, you know, virtually or attending a conference in Europe that I otherwise couldn't afford to do, afford time or money to do. But now actually I can because I can join virtually. I think we will keep a lot of these sorts of approaches in the post COVID world. I think, you know, we're, we're looking at a new flexi, you know, future of work and the way we approach things. And so the, the globalization um, of, well, of our society and, but also of science in general has been quite an extraordinary um, change. Uh, I have a question here. I'm as curious about the answer um, as the asker, because I have no idea. What is PARP? Ah, PARP. Okay, yes. So we have some, someone very scientifically, clinically savvy in, in the audience today. Um, yeah, so PARPs are actually, um, it stands for poly ADP ribose polymerase. I hope I got that right. PARP. And they're enzymes um, which uh, are involved in the pathways to repair damaged DNA inside cells. So when your cell gets um, DNA damage and mutations or DNA due to therapy or chemotherapy. Um, these are enzymes that, that fix the and repair the DNA. So the thinking of using um, in cancer therapy PARP inhibitors is to block the cancer cells from repairing themselves. So you can deliver a therapy that will um, essentially make the cancer cell very unhappy and then you can inhibit the PARP so that they don't have that repair mechanism inbuilt. So it's a it's a new drug to try and help um, aid cancer therapies. Oh, good. I'm glad we're getting into some <laughs> of the clinical specifics because this is, uh, I think there are people in the audience who are really, um, you know, very curious to hear what you have to say about this. Along similar lines, can CAR T therapy be used to treat glioblastoma? Yeah, look, and that's the hope. We don't know yet, but there has been three clinical trials to date targeting a couple of different proteins on the cancer cells in the brain. The beauty, what we, what we do know from these studies is that, you know, an, an, an intravenous, just in your arm, an administration of these living drugs, these CAR T cells actually do traffic into the brain and they can induce tumor regression. So they can kill the tumor. And so they were, they were and that they were safe um, and that there were very minimal toxicities. And so no side effects really. Uh, with the exception of one patient that received a very high dose. But, um, but there haven't been any cures yet. And the, the reason for that is that the, 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 the proteins that were targeted on the tumours then under selective pressure escaped the therapy. And, and so they then became invisible to the T cells. So the T cells were very effective at doing their job but just not, not fast enough that then the cancer, the cancer outgrew them. And so that's why I strongly believe that a what we call a monotherapy or just using one line of therapy, i.e. CAR T cells on their own, won't be sufficient. We will need to come at these tumours with a multi-pronged approach. So CAR T cells will be one piece of the puzzle, as will be increasing our toolkit so that we can target multiple proteins on the same tumour cell rather than just one, that's what's happening at the moment. So, you know, really, because this is really new therapy, this is really cutting edge frontline stuff. So once we can target multiple proteins, will be able to hit the cancer cell from different angles, then in combination with radiation chemotherapy and other drugs and, and potentially other small um, drugs um, such as uh, other in inhibitors, for example, even PARP inhibitors. So, so that's, that's the thinking there. So the answer is not yet, but we hope so. Okay, all right. Um, <laughs> uh, another question from the audience today, are the pathways into children's brain tumors different from those in adults? Yeah, they are actually. Um, so um, childhood, so, you know, as I sort of said in the interview, cancer's lots of different diseases. And so within, a, within one tumour type, they're different diseases. So, and then children's brain tumours are very different from adults. Um, brain tumours in kids tend to um, change from sort of low grade and slow growing um, to then high grade and growing 
fast and become more serious. Um, and But children with brain tumours generally often, if we were to lump all the brain tumours together, and there's lots of different kinds of tumours and some have you know, worse and some have better outcomes. Um, but generally speaking, um, children with brain tumours have a better prognosis than adults with a similar condition. Um, the other clinical difference is that um, brain tumours in adults um, uh, sorry, the sorry, paediatric brain cancers are generally more sensitive um, to therapy. Uh, with, and there again, there are some exceptions to this. One of, one of which I work on, which grows in the brain stem in kids, which is devastating. These kids die within a year, almost universally fatal, and it's completely resistant. But most other brain tumours are sensitive um, to therapy. Um, and also, um, you know, the other thing is that, of course, when you think about a, a child's brain, it's, it's still developing, it's still growing, it's still laying down all those neural pathways. And so um, the spectrum of side effects is much broader in children as well, because, of course, radiation therapy brings increased risk of long-term um, long sequelae, like long-term effects, uh, including even, you know, cognitive function mm. as well. And so, yes, so they're, they're, they are very different diseases. They come from different, um, they have a lot of different mutations in them as well that, that sort of characterise them too. Uh, I'm fascinated to hear what you'll have to say about this. Um, can you tell us about the models of research you use? Animal models are important, but raise issues of how transferable those models are to human tumours. Yeah, definitely. Really great question. We've got some really great um, questions coming from the audience today. So, uh, so first of all, yes, we use brain, um, brain cancer cells. So, you know, cell tumours that have come directly out of um, patients' tumours in the brain into a dish and then we can grow them in a dish, these patient-derived xenograft lines, we call them. Um, and then it, and we call that in vitro. When something's growing in a dish in the lab, that's in vitro. And so then we can do all of our functional testing. We can see if our T cells can kill these cells and we can look at you know, their activation and their growth and all of these sorts of characteristics. And once we're satisfied that we've, that we've, our T, that we've developed a T cell that's able to kill these cells in a dish, then we, can, then we need to know if they're safe in an animal model. And so we do use mice for that. We don't shy away from that. It's a, quite a sensitive subject for a lot of people. But the way I approach this is that if it takes us a few mice, it takes us some mice to actually develop a therapy that will, ki that will um, kill brain cancer and we can help um, kids with brain cancer and adults with brain cancer. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Um, so what we do is we grow um, brain tumours in the mice and then we give them the T cells. And so then we can actually, and those tumours that we grow, we can label with fluorescent markers so we can use fancy, fancy pieces of equipment to actually watch them growing in live in real time in the mice. Uh, and then we give our therapy and watch them shrink and melt away. So that's quite extraordinary when you see that happen. And in terms of how transferable that is uh, from, you know, the example in the mouse to, to how it turns out in a human, have you found so far when in developing, in this field, in developing other treatments that that has proved to be the case? It's not, yeah. like, not like you've had instances where it goes, oh, it works in a mouse, but not in a human. Absolutely. It can work in a mouse and not a human. There are, there are lots of caveats in working in mice. The problem is there's nothing, in, you know, there's not much in between. So, you know, yeah. you, it's, it's one of those tricky things where you do as best you can to, to show that it's safe. And lots of, there's lots of other experiments and things we do to show that, that a therapy is safe um, to go before it's ready to go into a human. Um, and so, yes, sometimes they're not transferable. And actually brain cancer is one of those diseases where there are not good animal models. You know, there are other kinds of tumours that have really well, good and well-established animal models to be able to study the disease. And, you know, competent mice that already have a, you know, a good, healthy functioning immune system. Um, and brain cancer is not, not great at that. So we're actually generating some in the lab right now um, so that we can, again, increase that, those tools in the toolkit to be able to make sure that the therapies are safe and also more transferable into a human setting. We've got a few people asking this question and I had it too. So I feel it's probably a, a good one to end on. Um, and it's how COVID has changed your work. Um, I mean, you talked to, we've, we've talked today about uh, how literacy, everyone's medical literacy has improved. Your work is no doubt more valued than ever before. Um, has it made research more difficult? How has it, how has it just changed it in general? 
It's changed a lot. I mean, we're just, we're also just a workplace like any other workplace as well. So, you know, when the government implemented uh, requirements for social distancing, so did, so did we, social distance. And so, you know, during state, the peak of stage four lockdown, the lab was essentially shut down. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately we don't work in the sort of line of work where you can just leave your work on your desk and then come back to it. You know, we had cells in culture, we had cohorts of mice that had brain tumors that needed looking after. Um, and so, you know, so we did all of those essential um, husbandry issues that then, you know, we pretty much shut down and then it's taken us a long time to then ramp back up again. So this sort of the ramping up and ramping down has, has severely slowed us down and affected our work for sure. And then as well on top of that, we had all of the human element that every other workplace has had where, you know, we have lots of, we have a big team and everyone had different personal circumstances and kid, homeschooling kids and trying to do experiments at the same time. So having to do them late at night and weekends. So it's been very disruptive for everyone. Um, absolutely. So we're just all, I think that's why uh, yesterday was such a, a, such a happy day to see those vaccines roll out and into people's arms and that, um, you know, I will never eradicate COVID, you know, um, in my opinion, but it will always be living with it in, in some sense or form, but certainly, having a, um, you know, a swathe of vaccines at our disposals, uh, the first way to, for things to get back to a sort of post-COVID world, which I think will look like a different place. I, I guess I also wondered, I mean, you mentioned some of the negative impacts there and, and we talked as well today about that all research is standing, is about standing on the shoulders of uh, other research. Absolutely. And I know they're incredibly different fields, but you know, the rate at which COVID-19 vaccines have been developed, have, have smashed hopes, smashed records, um, have those rapid advances, will they have effects um, in, in your field at all or is it just too far removed? Oh, no. I mean, look, there's a lot of, there's a lot of crossover in all of this. I mean, the technique, you know, the sort of using viral vectors to make a vaccine is also the sort of same sort of viral vectors we use to introduce our cars into our T-cells. So there's a lot of overlapping technology. And what's, what people may not fully appreciate is the, you know, the level of um, the scientific leap to get this Pfizer RNA vaccine, COVID vaccine is, is really quite extraordinary. Um, and so, you know, there is a huge scientific leap here. It's quite amazing. And so it's a really exciting, exciting time. I mean, you know, we've, we've gone through the hard yards, particularly those of us here in Melbourne, <laughs> it's been a really tough time under lockdown and curfews, um, which absolutely had to happen. It clearly did work. You know, we were able to really curtail the um, infectivity. Um, yeah, so. So it's pumped the brakes in the short term, but in the longer term, your job and, and your goals are going to be, I mean, your goals are going to be brought closer by the kinds of advances that we've seen in the last 12 months. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And, uh, and, also, and also definitely from a scientific point of view, and then there's this also this way of working, you know, um, being able to very quickly get in a Zoom box with someone who's across town and, or in a different or interstate or internationally and, they, you know, bringing in that expertise quite quickly. Everyone's far more literate now, aren't they, with these various technology platforms. So that's really changed the way we work in a positive way, actually, as well, you know, being able to work um, flexibly um, and being able to then increase, you know, our collaborations with other teams that, that maybe are overseas and in different time zones has been, has been amazing. I mean, the thought now of getting on a plane and going into state to give a seminar just seems so wasteful, you know, both yeah. in time and, and, um, and for the planet. Um, yeah. Not to underestimate the human element here as well. I mean, I think we all missed those conversations around the water cooler. <laughs> Uh, well, this is as good a conversation as any I've had around a water cooler. I think so. <laughs> Thank you so much for your generosity today and in answering uh, the audience's questions as well. We really appreciate it. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks so much, Ange. Uh, and thanks to everyone who's tuned in today to, to watch this. It will be available after the fact. Um, make sure you keep an eye out for more alumni our events from uh, the Melbourne University of Melbourne uh, and we will catch you back here next time.